Battery. My name's Colleen Curlin. I lead the programming here at the Battery. So glad, thanks Stacey. I'm so glad to welcome you all tonight. Um, for those of you who aren't Battery members, welcome. We're glad to have you. Um, tonight, we're here to talk about women in the workplace in a post-pandemic world. Very important topic. And it's interesting because we started planning this, Rashmi and I started planning this in March of 2020, or we're planning for March of 2020. <laughs> and we had to put it on pause for what we thought might be a month or two. And here we are in March of 2022. So I'm so glad that we're here and we're going to talk about this tonight. Um, this is part of our Women's March programming, which is part of Women of the Battery, which is one of our societies. Um, we're really proud of it. We've got a couple more events coming up. Um, if you're interested, you can check them out on our website and reach out to us if you want to join. But tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome Alexis Krivkovich, co-founder, co-founding author of Women in the Workplace Report, groundbreaking research that's the benchmark for progress for women in corporate America and is used by many organizations across the globe. Alexis also serves as a faculty at McKenzie's Executive Transitions Masterclass and Change Leaders Forum and is a regular speaker on financial innovation, change management, and top team effectiveness. And joining Alexis in conversation is Rashmi Maria. Rashmi is a board leader and diversity and equity and inclusion advisor, working with local and national organizations that focus on gender equity and education. And most recently, she served as board chair of a national politi political organization focused on empowering women to serve in elected and appointed political office, which is great. So tonight we're going to hear more about the background of the report, details that are unique to this year's past challenges, and some takeaways to bring to our workplaces. Before I hand it over to you all, we are live streaming tonight and we'll be broadcasting it on our Battery TV YouTube page and we'll have a Q&A towards the end of the hour. Um, and other than that, I'll hand it over to you, Rashmi. Thank you, Colleen. Welcome everyone and welcome to Alexis. Thanks so much for being here and sharing the research findings of this amazing report. How many people have had time to read the report or skim through it? It's okay if you haven't, I just want a basic idea. Um, so on the Battery website is a link to the report, which I think you will be enticed after this conversation to dig deeper. There is so much information and I have to say, it is so comprehensive and so clearly uh, written by women. And what I mean by that is um, it is so detailed, it is so rich with information. And I think what I found particularly amazing about it is not only do you quantify some of these experiences that people have felt and not really understood whether is this just me or am I really feeling like that was a microaggression or is this just me but I didn't get that promotion again. You take all of that, you quantify it in a very data-driven way, but you've also incorporated the voices of women at different levels in terms of their direct experiences. And so within the report, there are vignettes and comments of, by women who are in different roles about the challenges that they've faced. And the other thing I thought was very neat about that is you will identify the woman as like a black woman, a white woman, and then you'll t tell what their role is, as well as something more personal, like caregiver to an adult, caregiver to a child, and you really humanize these people who make up the, the data within the report. So I just have to say it's really compelling, and I encourage everyone to, to read it. Um, Colleen and I were able to, to start talking about this um, report back in 2020, because this is now the seventh year that this report has been published. And, you know, now we've lived through a pandemic and it's been a really challenging time for all people, but in particular women. And it really, there's so many implications of how women's lives have been changed through this pandemic and their work lives as well. So I just thought we would start with Alexis. Um, so again, welcome to you. And could you give us some background into this report? Yeah, sure. Um, well, we've had two years to plan this conversation, so I feel like we better nail it. <laughs> um, it's really fun to be here. This is my um, favorite way to spend time, honestly. So thank you all for uh, for choosing to spend your time with us too. Um, this was, I'll tell a little bit the origin story because I think it's, um, it's relevant uh, to where we ended up here. This started in part because I walked into a room of a large global leadership meeting and I saw just this sea of men. And I thought, whoa, it was so noticeable. I actually stopped and thought, wow, this is the leadership. Like, like it or not, this is the leadership. And I stand out here. And then my second thought was, what happened? Because, 
you know, I graduated college and my class was 50% women. I went off to business schools, less than 50%, but it was maybe more like 40%. I started my job, maybe it's a little less than that. Now we're down to 35%. But still, when I looked at leadership teams that weren't diverse, I thought, well, we just haven't gotten there yet. It's just, I just have to arrive. And then I arrived and it was like, this looks a lot more like the picture 20 years ago than the picture I thought I'd see 20 years from now. And so I started calling my friends and I started asking the same thing. Like, do you experience this? Do you look around and see this sea of non-diverse leaders that don't, a, a, a class that doesn't feel like it represents you anymore? And they were saying the same thing. So then I started asking business leaders, hey, like, why don't you have more women at the table? What? And I started getting a really unsatisfying response. Like, well, my daughter's friend, whatever, had these cute little babies. And then I was like, if you tell me one more time about the story of someone who just opted out because they weren't interested anymore, I'm going to strangle you because that can't explain the entirety of this picture. And it was so fact-free. Everything else in business, we use such a fact base to get to the root cause of the issues and we dial into it and we're like, okay, we can solve that because we have the facts now to know what we need to do. And when it came to talent, it felt like this really important topic. We were talking about it in this vague way that made me feel very little confidence we were going to make the kind of progress that I had thought was going to happen in the time it took me to get to leadership and what I expected to see in the next decade ahead. And so that was really the idea behind Women in the Workplace. Like, we know how to do data at McKinsey. We love numbers. Let's go out and get the data. And in the first year, we had to literally call up companies and be like, I've got this thing. I can't show it to you because I don't know what it's going to look like. But just give me all your most sensitive information about a topic you're doing a terrible job at. And I promise you, I won't name you, but I will know. <laughs> and I'm going to come back to you. <laughs> and then I'll play it back somehow in this way. And I'm waving my hands and, you know, it's important. Let's do this together. And we got a set of companies, about 100, to participate. And that was the first year of our report. And the first year, the punchline that ran across all the papers and was a headline in the Wall Street Journal was 100 years. And that was the validation I was looking for because 100 years was how long it was gonna take to get equity for women in the C-suite. And I thought, okay, I have three daughters. So this is like my daughters, 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 daughter. You know, and I stopped counting. I remember when the team came to me with that, I was on a trip somewhere and I'm pacing in a hallway and I'm like, that can't be right. Like, build a better model. Like, you're, you're McKinsey consultants. Like, go <laughs> add more assumptions. And they're like, 237 years, 482 years, six. And I was like, okay, this is like becoming an asymptote. This is not working. So I was like, let's go with 100. 100 is enough. But the point was, like, we can't sit still and let the answer be 100 years. And so that, for me, was really the call to action to say, this has to be something different, and we have to have everyone. I mean, I love seeing a room full of women and some very... Um, brave and supportive men, but we need actually room of everyone talking about this conversation. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think because of this report, because of the tools that you've also provided within it, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can shrink down those hundred years because the best part about the report is not, it does lay bare some very stark facts about how difficult the pandemic has been, about the difficulties that women face in the workplace but there's some very concrete tools and action items that can really drive some change. So I think let's just start with this concept starting at the beginning of someone's career. I'm gonna read, I just thought it would be nice to bring in the voices of some of the women so, um, who are detailed in the report. So I just wanna read a quote about something that you deem and call the broken rung. It says, I've talked to white men who started off in the warehouse and now they are at the VP level. I've also talked to a lot of brown and black employees that have been here for 15 years and are at the same level that they started at or a bit higher, but they are nowhere near their white male peers or, or their white peers. And that was a black woman in a senior manager role caring for an adult person, an elderly person. So to me, that really speaks to the fact that yes, people do wanna to progress to your earlier point. Don't tell me that everyone's opting out. I know people want to. Can you tell us about what is the broken rung? What is that phenomenon and what is the implication of that? Yeah, I think this was one of the most important findings we surfaced in the data a few years ago, which is when we first painted the picture of the pipeline, what you see is a picture that starts near parity. So this is these are roles that progress to um, senior level leadership. So this is what we think of as corporate America. It includes smaller companies, it includes bigger companies across all industries. It does not include field workers, 
Um, in general, it does not include wage workers who are not on a path um, of leadership progression because we're focused on getting leadership in the top. And there's a very important and different um, work that needs to be done on those other questions. But these are people who should have access to continue to progress. And what you see now today, seven years in, is 48% are women and nearly 18% are women of color. And that's pretty close to representative, not quite, but pretty close to representative of the population of talent they could be pulling from. But by the time you get to the C-suite, you're down to one in four. And for women of color, you're nearly not represented at all. One in 20, one in 25. And so everyone focuses at the top because that picture is awful and the greatest gains have happened at the top. So we can celebrate that progress is happening. I'd argue it's because we were so bad and so far behind that a lot of companies, in fact, what we found, the way they've solved that is they've added roles at the leadership level to create a new seat at the table. It's one way to get there, but you can't infinitely solve a problem that way. But what we found in the data that was so fascinating about the broken rung is that the biggest moment of inequity is at the very start. The first step up from individual contributor to what we think of as first level manager is the most imbalance between men and women. Proportionally for whatever you have in your company, so wherever you're starting from, whether you start at 50-50, 60-40, it doesn't matter, but for every 100 men who leaps forward, only 86 women do. 86, and you think like, well, not that far off, but we're talking about cross populations of hundreds of thousands of individuals in any given year. What you lose in that inequity is a talent pipeline of two million future women leaders who when companies look to hire or to pull up the next leader into the ranks, they don't have them because they've lost it at the very start. And that's what we call the broken rung because in most organizations, it's the least managed place in the pipeline. We spend a lot of time at the top, we think about diversity slates, we do all of this extra training and work, but when it comes to that first level position, what do a lot of companies do? They say like, hey, you're about to leave that role, you should write your job description. And you're like, I was great, I'm gonna describe me. Now already we've got more men in those roles than women. You add all these things that actually aren't necessarily factors that really describe success in the role, they were just factors that worked for you, and so it creates this gatekeeping which is a huge challenge. Like I write up, well, I, I was the head of lacrosse. I'm going to write something about sports now. You know, I mean, all these things that don't actually in any statistical way matter. And then when you don't get all the applicants you want, you go around and you tell people like, you should apply, you should apply. And what do we know is that men will generally apply if they meet 60% of the criteria. Women will apply when they meet 100. Well, right there, you're not even going to see the applicants that you would want. And that's before we've even introduced any amount of bias in the evaluation process itself. Because we know in evaluations that men are promoted on potential and women are, are promoted on performance. So I want to see a little more track record. I want to see a little more time. And that's why what you see ultimately with Broken Rung is women, like this case, feeling like again and again the opportunity passes them by. Well, one thing you pointed out before is when you are trying to get to that first promotion, how much previous experience can you really have? in the sense that both sets of those people could be very equal. They both started at the same time. One is a man, one is a woman, but because of the evaluation process being probably very biased, they're just not gonna get that chance because women do often get the feedback that you're not ready, not yet, not quite, maybe just these other two or three things, but you don't really hear that as much with, with men getting that feedback. So if that's the case, um, I'm just wondering, do you have suggestions that from your report of what companies could do in order I don't to know address what, I them? don't know what to do, but no. <laughs> <laughs> it's hopeless. That's the next conversation. <laughs> Uh, I mean, on the broken rung in particular, I think there's a bunch of things companies need to do. So the first thing is you got to look at the data. Like you've got to actually peel back the layers and stare at it really closely and not at the aggregate level because aggregates hide a lot of sins. Like if your whole company feels really diverse to you and it's all women in marketing and it's all men in engineering, that's not diverse. And you're not getting the benefit of what all the research shows diversity is all about, which is the tension you put in the system with different thoughts, different perspectives, and different experiences. So you actually have to stare at it and go, oh, bleep, that is really uncomfortable over there. 
right? That we don't have the diversity spread the way we want. You've got to look at each time you do a round of promotions, just pull the numbers and say, did we get the proportions we would expect? And if not, let's go back and review it. When we go to campuses, we don't say like, well, just put up a shingle and see who shows up. Companies actually seek out the types of talent, the breadth of talent they're looking for. You need to do that inside your company too. Don't wait for people to raise their own hand. You have to go out and find it. And then you got to take the playbook that most companies now, the good news is, have really already developed at the top around you know, the training, the bias interruptions, the things that actually get you to reset when you have structural difference in the system that's giving you out unwanted outcomes and, and reset the process. Like one of the things we see quite clearly is that the feedback women and get and men get is very different. And for any of you who's a woman of color, even more so in terms of how a lot of the exact same results that people want to see are couched in very different terms. So you're a man, you have a meeting and you really fumble it. You'll get pulled aside and you're more likely to hear you weren't buttoned up on the numbers. That's not acceptable here. You want to get into that next job. You're going to have to tighten up here. They're going to expect to see operationally here. You need to go away, spend three hard months and figure out how to wire that in to your team. If you're a woman, you get pulled aside. It's like, you know, your story wasn't very tight. It was hard to follow the impact path you're creating. You should spend some more time thinking about how you put those messages together so people can really see how this is really being run and coming together. And if you're a woman of color, and in particular, when I talk to black women, you'll get told like, yeah, that went pretty well. I mean, you should keep working it. But I, I think, do you have any feedback? Right? No, no, I thought, I thought that was good. And so the problem is, what do you go do? What do you go action on that? If that's the kind of feedback you're getting? Like how many, for the women in the room here, how many of you have ever heard in a performance review, aggressive, sharp, Evlo needs more gravitas, could stand up more, um, a little... Um, anti-competitive, can be difficult to work with. Has anyone ever heard any term? Someone here has gotten gravitas on their, yeah. Yeah, it's like what man has ever heard you need gravitas? Like I've never met the man who's gotten gravitas in this feedback review. Um, but what we saw, so when we first did this research, we asked like, hey, do you ask for promotions? Do you ask for stretch assignments? Do you ask for advancement? And women and men in increasingly equal levels will say yes. But then we also asked, hey, have you ever gotten feedback that you're arrogant, aggressive, sharp elbow, difficult to work with, um, non-collaborative, pushy, um, bossy, thank you. What was that? Abrasive, Abrasive yes. Yeah. What was that? Nagging. Nagging, yes. Oh, yeah, and we're like, could we do just like yeah, a word cloud right now? <laughs> <laughs> totally, yes. And the thing was, was we then cross-cut it by had you asked for an advancement or an opportunity for something more? And if you were a man, like, first of all, those words just didn't show up on your list. But if they did at all, no correlation. Like, whether you ask for a promotion or not, whether you ask for a stretch assignment or not, whether you ask for a raise or not, no correlation. Women, you were twice as likely to hear that in a feedback report, in some performance review, if you'd asked for anything to advance. And so this is the double bind. It's like, we're not getting the opportunity. The broken rung is real. We've measured it. It persists year after year. And so we're like, so go ask for it. You go out there. You ask for what you want. Oh, you're a little bossy. <laughs> you're you're kind of naggy. You're a little abrasive to work with. And then you're like, what the? Oh, and by the way, we're not going to pay you the same amount for the same job. And you're like, all right, I'm out of here. And that's, and that's effectively what women start to feel. Well, I think one takeaway as well for people thinking, well, what am I going to do if I'm in that situation? So if you are being given feedback at work, really thinking about was that feedback useful and is there something I can operationalize and do with that? So, you know, I will just give a little benefit of the doubt to the people who are struggling to provide this feedback because to me it indicates that they're not trained properly, that they feel a discomfort with, oh, I know that there are people that I'm trying to be a little bit more delicate with and they're not understanding that the way that they're providing feedback is actually harmful. So it's a good question to ask ourselves when we are receiving feedback or when we're doing a performance review, get specific, make that person get specific and say, help me understand how I could be better at that. Or can you give me something quantitative to wrap my arms around? Do you yeah. have any other suggestions? No, I mean, I think that's spot on. The, the thing I encourage everyone to do is say, I would like to get to position X. What is a skill you think I need to build to get to position X? So you name it so they know what your ambition is. 
and then you anchor them on what you actually want, which is not like, oh, I think you could talk a little more slowly. Okay, I don't think that's gonna get me to there. So like, what? that's good, what else <laughs> would help? To get to really the specifics that help you progress. And when you see someone describing or giving fear, like, well, I think they're good, but they're just, they just don't quite have it. Well, nobody can action don't quite have it. So you can always be the person too for someone else who says like, well, that's really hard to work with. Like, what's a specific observation you'd have about a skill they need to develop further? And then in companies who really do this well, what they do is they take that specific action item and they assign it not to the individual to go solve for themselves, but to the manager. And say, you now own getting her to there. Yeah, and in terms of training as well, I think one thing you've talked about in the past is that companies with HR departments who are hiring in have gotten better about anti-bias training and things of that sort, but they need to now take that and apply it to this first level like of training managers and helping them to provide feedback, to objectively set criteria, because people don't always understand what is the objective criteria that I need to meet in order to progress. So, so it's not a really hard unlock in the sense that no, in I many cases playbook, it's working, right? Yeah, the, I think the playbook is there. I, th I think what a lot of companies miss that we see is, you know, 92% of companies will say we have standard objective criteria we use to evaluate employees. Of course. I mean, first of all, it should be higher than 92% because you could probably get sued. You don't. But like every company is like, yeah, of course, we have standard objective criteria we use to evaluate performance. Only 47% of employees will agree that they see standard objective criteria used to evaluate performance. 47%. I mean, we haven't even gotten to half. And the reality is I sit down with executives all the time. We're like, what's the silver bullet? What's the new thing I haven't tried? I'm like, how about the thing you're doing today that isn't yet working? I mean, there's this huge daylight between the aspiration that most organizations have today and their execution of how that's playing out on the ground. And so that's a big piece of it too, is just getting from, we have these tools in theory, we're applying them inconsistently, only at the top, sometimes not really that well at all. Um, and what a lot of organizations need to do at a minimum, or as part of that process at least, there's a lot more they can do if they really wanna lean into it, but is really start with like, how about you make sure the stuff you've, you think you've rolled out that you're patting yourself on the back for is actually working. You know, I want to talk a little bit about the pandemic because this report has been published year upon year, but this is the first time the report has been published after a pandemic when the work landscape has changed radically. And in, in learning more, we, we always knew that women take on a second shift, right? People, women go home, they're largely in charge of childcare, household duties, et cetera. But one thing that is also pointed out is because of the pandemic, there's something called a triple shift, which I was like, whoa, the double shift was enough and now there's a triple <laughs> shift. And I thought this was really interesting because to me it builds the case for, you know, there's so many reasons why women in the workplace make sense across every dimension, whether it's financial impact, whether it's just, you know, the way that women support other employees. And in this case, the triple shift is really largely about the emotional load that women take on to caretake and to build up their own employees and their coworkers. So maybe you could talk about that a bit more. Yeah, I mean, it, it was fascinating. We, in the early days, we measured the double shift, which everyone knew <laughs> existed, but we put, you know, we put the numbers behind it. And what I found fascinating was irrespective of your level in an organization that you had achieved as a woman and irrespective of your balance of earning power, even when you were not only the primary, but the sole breadwinner, you disproportionately did the household work, no matter what. You disproportionately did the household work. And in fact, mothers with young children in the pandemic, when everything exploded, were spending five hours a day or more on household responsibilities. Because if any of you in the room had kids during the period where there was no schooling, there was no childcare, daycares were closing, there were no camps, you were like, principal also 
grading papers and a line chef cook and you scrubbed a toilet while you were on a conference call and then you did your, you know, your day job. And then you also like shot, you know, like a quesadilla out the door to somebody. <laughs> like, and, Here you go. You're still in your pajamas, but good luck to you. Right. So you were doing this crazy. And what was fascinating is like fathers of young children were not having the same experience. They just, they were not like, they literally would say like, Oh, a little bit. No, you know, so, I mean, it's been kind of nice. I get on my Peloton a lot. <laughs> You're like, I'm going to strangle you. Not, not all of them. Not, not all, all of them. them. No, but the point was, and, and there were all these, like, there were all these mismatches in, in how this all played out. So 70, 77% of fathers said across the pandemic, you know what? My, my life balance got better. Yeah, yeah. You're like, oh my God. You're like, <laughs> like, I'd like to meet you and sit you down for an hour at my kitchen table with my children. Um, but, and only 32% of mothers of young children agreed with that statement. Like, no surprise. They're having very different experiences. Over 70% of men said they do half the housework. Less than 40% of women agreed with them that they were doing half the housework. So like there, there's huge gaps in even recognizing what's going on. And most companies headed into the pandemic said like, that sucks, but that's society and hangover from, you know, Mad Men era. That's not ours to solve. But the problem was the number one thing that women worried about was their job performance. They worried about the stigma associated with the caretaking, where the guy would get the like, oh, look at you, dad, taking a moment, and she'd get the, I'm not sure, are you working at, how many hours are you working? When are you getting this stuff done, right? They worry that they'd be measured on inputs, not outputs. They just worry that they might lose their minds before they could get all this stuff done. And that was the double shift that just exploded. But what we found this past year that I thought was so fascinating was this point about the triple shift. And the triple Now's shift- Now's the time to take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> I swear we're going to get to solutions. Um, but the triple shift was this phenomenon we saw that the same thing effectively was happening in the workplace, too. And it wasn't office housework, which has long been talked about, but isn't easy to measure. This was the core stuff that companies were saying really mattered right now in the moment of the pandemic. And what we saw very clearly is women were disproportionately doing it. Women, were, women leaders are 60% more likely to check in on their employees' well-being. They're 26% more likely to be checking in to see if your workload is manageable, if you've got the balance you need, and how you're spending your time. They are twice as likely to be sponsors and mentors to those rising up in their organization beneath them, even though they're half as likely to be in leadership themselves. They are disproportionately doing the diversity, equity, and inclusion work in their organizations, and even though 87% of companies say that work is critically important, especially right now, only 24% of them actually evaluate it as part of your performance review and give you any credit for doing it. Or any compensation. For or any it. compensation. Oh, pff, compensation. <laughs> <laughs> Have another drink. <laughs> right. I'm going to read this quote um, about the, this triple shift from a woman in the report. It says, I feel so much responsibility for my team's well-being. There is no line between the weekday, the work day, sorry, and the after work day. We underestimate the impact this is having on people emotionally and personally. I am taking care of everybody. I will regularly have conversations with my team about questions like, how are you feeling? What do you need? And how can I remove barriers? And that is so exactly what you're saying, that, that this critical work of retaining employees and keeping them going through this really, really hard time fell on the shoulders of women disproportionately. Well, and what was fascinating how we did the research was we asked everyone, right? And some of my colleagues who worked on this there, and they always point this out. Um, we asked everyone, hey, manager, do you do this? Do you do this? Do you check in on people? Do you? And everyone's like, yes, I do that. And then we ask employees, hey, does your manager do this, do that? Do and it's like, it was just like the conversation about um, objective criteria. People are like, you know, not so much. But when you ask them, hey, do they do that? And they said yes. And then later you ask them, hey, is your manager having to be a woman or a man? And you cut the data that way? That's when you see the difference. So we think we're doing all sorts of things. We all wake up every day and we think we're, we're giving it our all. Everybody thinks they're giving it their all. But what we see clearly in the data across, and this is nearly 70,000 employees across every walk um, 
of life in terms of the industries and jobs they hold in corporate America, what we see consistently in the pattern is we are not doing it equally. And women are disproportionately holding this load. And it matters not only because it feels good and it's just the hallmark of good leadership, it matters because employees who say that their manager does check in this way, they're happier, they're less likely to leave, they show much lower levels of burnout, and they're focused on their jobs. And in this moment of great reflection and attrition in the hottest job market we've ever seen, companies are like, yes, I need that. And they're like, that's so great. Do you reward that? No, I do not yet, <laughs> but I should. And maybe they don't know how to measure it. Is that something that comes up? That there's this triple shift and we're calling yeah. it like, I don't know exactly the right way to term it, but you are really um, looking after your coworkers and employees in ways that maybe are hard to measure. So what is your response to that? You can measure anything if you want to. You can find a way to measure anything. I mean, yes, is it simpler to measure a revenue target than you know employee experience? Sure. I guess, but you know, the simplest way to measure sponsorship, by the way, and we've just done this for McKinsey and we've done it for clients, is you go out to every employee in the company, you ask them three questions. How many sponsors do you have? And do you have enough? How good is the sponsorship you get? Here's a drop down list unaided of everyone who's a leader in this organization. Add any names of people you think of as sponsors. There you go, you have all the data you need and you cut that data and you will find out who are the small fraction of your leaders, women and men, who are disproportionately holding the load of sponsorship, not just for everybody, but particularly for diverse talent. Because what we see clearly in the data is men describe networks full of men, women describe networks full of women. At the earliest stage of your career, that may be just fine, but in a pipeline at the top, that's 75% male, one of those networks is way more useful to you over time. And what we need is to break this mindset that, you know, I'm best suited to really sponsor the people and mentor the people who've had experiences like mine. I couldn't be the one to sponsor and really support this woman of color because my life is nothing like her life. I Somebody else is the right leader for that. And the answer is if you're sitting in the leadership seat, you are the leader who's right for that. And when you get with these leaders individually and you show them that data and they're like, this is you, this is your dot point. 90% of the people who named you are men. You have zero people who are an individual of color. Look at the diverse talent in our organization. Do you think that's enough? That's when you get the concrete conversation, I think, where people start changing their behavior. But I think you're right that in general, most companies go, ooh, that feels harder to measure. We'll just talk about how important it is and we'll sort of let the unmanaged outcome roll. I mean, this leads to this concept of sponsorship versus mentorship. And I've heard a lot of women say, I've a lot of mentors and not a lot of sponsors. Could you cut the difference for us and yes. help us understand the difference between the two? I think that's so, so true. And um, and I think, there, I think there's sort of community and creating a sense of support, which a lot of employee resource groups try to do. Then you have mentorship. Um, and then you have true sponsorship. And they're they're all important in different ways, but a lot of companies and a lot of individuals, leaders will confuse and conflate those, and it's it's really unhelpful to do. So I think about mentorship as free advice, hopefully good advice, ideally somewhat tailored to you and not just the individual's experience, but it's like the hours of the day you have and the number of cups of coffee you're willing to have, you could dole this out all over town. And in fact, a lot of people do. And they're like, I am a sponsor to 37 people. And I'm like, then you don't know what sponsorship is because you cannot do that for 37 people well. Because sponsorship is finite. Sponsorship is about using your position of power, your influence, your network to support someone else. It's usually a relationship that endures over some amount of time. It's a commitment. Sometimes it's sort of two-way, like there's some amount of quid pro quo associated with it in terms of like being on someone's team or supporting projects or things so you build together. But by definition, I truly believe to do sponsorship well, you cannot do it for 37 people simultaneously. It has to be a smaller set of people where you're trying to actually help move them through opportunity, open doors for them they don't have access to, connect them to people they wouldn't otherwise be connected to. And what we see for women, and in particular for women of color, consistently is over-mentored and under-sponsored. 
And in fact, in a lot of organizations, there are like a very small number of diverse talent, often like one black woman, one Hispanic male who everybody knows and sees and they're like, I have someone diverse, I'm sponsoring you. And they're all pointing to the same person. And then there are all these other folks who describe being on the desert island and feeling like they have nothing. And so I truly believe like this is not like match.com, right? Or it's probably like Tinder now or something. <laughs> of course, that'd be dangerous in the workplace. But I mean, this is not about love matches. This is like, you can engineer this. And in fact, like, yes, you want people to find like-based things. You do need some amount of commitment. So if there's no common ground, it's very difficult to do. But this idea that you're going to wait for this, you know, huge wave of men at the top to suddenly spark a recognition that there's all this diverse talent in their organization they're not supporting and not truly sponsoring and go seek it out and find it. It just doesn't happen. The data suggests it doesn't happen without some help. So there's a couple of ways to approach this on the individual level and on the company level. So I think that you have said before and maybe also a few minutes ago that companies can engineer this and these programs can be totally formalized within an organization sponsorship programs. Because what happens as well is that the person who's looking to be sponsored, if they're an only, and if there are these other phenomenon at play, everything feels like it falls on that person to make things happen for themselves because the overriding environment and the vibe of the place is, well, you're here. Hey, you're here and you just go make it happen. Kind of like what you said earlier. So, um, so two things, could you talk about for the person who wants to find a sponsor, the authentic, genuine way to go about that, because I don't think that's intuitive for people, especially when they're trying to not step on the broken rung and they want to go on the next rung. Um, and then secondly, maybe you could talk about um, your own, I'd love to hear a personal example of from you about a, a way in which you were sponsored that was meaningful to you. Maybe a small yeah. personal story, if that's okay. No, absolutely. I, I, I think this is the hardest part, right? Because you see, um, and what, women will describe as this barrier to the access that other people seem to have, these roles and opportunities that don't open up for them and they don't know how to get to it. And, and the reason so much sponsorship ends up being left to sort of the social flows is because at the end of the day, it tends to work best when there's some common ground for connection, right? Just walking up to someone and be like, hey, I'd love for you to sponsor me. You know, I mean, people, you know, maybe in the moment you fright them enough and start, they're like, yeah, yes, sure. You know, but the chances that that endures and they really do that for you um, ends up being unlikely. So you have to create that space. My advice um, to everyone is first start with, start with a list of what you have. Like you have something, you have some, you have a friend who started in, you know, when you did. You have someone you graduated school with who you call every time something happens. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe. You have someone you've met in the company that maybe you did a project with who's not a sponsor, but maybe could become one over time. Think about those people and think about what they give you today because you don't need every individual in your, you know, what I think of as your personal board of directors. You don't need every individual to play the same role. And they don't need to all play all roles. Some people, their only job is to tell you the honest truth. Like, I got to tell you, when they say that, you're screwed. You should move on. And sometimes you need to hear that. So you're like, what the, and then you're like, you're right. I need to move on. And that's the role that person plays for you. But to find sponsorship in your organization, my best advice is to find someone who you think can help you, where you think you can build a connection over time potentially. And not like walk to them and be like, be my sponsor, but say like, I really admire what you do. I want to one day be in a seat like yours. And I would love any uh, concrete you, advice you have on a skill I could be working on to build towards that, to the point of feedback. And over time, if you were willing to find something I could work on with you, a special project you're doing, or just an opportunity to get to know better, like what it took you to get to where you are today, which is a lot more like mentorship than sponsorship. But I, I think in most situations, you have to start somewhere like that to grow to something. But I, if you don't declare it, I truly believe like in general, it won't, it won't happen. And so I think, um, I think for most folks, it makes, makes a big difference, um, there. And then, you know, just in terms of a personal story, I feel like the power of sponsors is not only doing the stuff you never know they're doing behind the scenes to support you, but to forgive when you don't deliver on your own promise and potential and help you see that there's more on the other side. 
And for me, um, going through a career with all the ups and downs of, you know, three kids and maternity leaves and, you know, trying to figure out a job and build back each time a whole program and a whole set of opportunities and keep moving forward and do my double shift. And I didn't realize I was doing a triple shift, but <laughs> lo and behold, I, I guess I was. But, you know, there were definitely moments where I had missteps after a really, just a really poor had a newborn baby. I was trying to cra travel across the country on these red eyes. I mean, it was a bad, it was a bad call all around on my part. Um, and it didn't go, lo, lo and behold, it did not go well. Um, sat me down and he said, okay, well, what's the one lesson you want to take away from this experience and hold going forward? And I was like, the one lesson? I was like, I have a very long list. I've been beating myself up for months. I'll pick one thing that you think constructively you've learned and you want to apply. And so we talked about that one thing and he's like, okay, now let it go. Reset, start again, done. And I don't want to talk about it anymore. I don't want to hear about it anymore. And you're not going to hear about it anymore from anybody. And I was like, wow, like that was a gift to have someone say like, it doesn't need to be perfect. And these things don't follow you forever. You can have a moment where you can say, okay, I'm going to pick one lesson. And then there's a bunch of lessons. I'm just going to say like, you know what? Like not, not for me and take the rest of it in confidence. And the fact that he had that confidence for me allowed me to sort of reset mine. Yeah, that is, that is amazing, right? Because you kind of expected this person to come at you probably with, oh, let me just tell you the eight things that I see or that I've heard from other people. But he had faith in you. He knows your potential. And he knew that he knew your life circumstance as well. So that's a really great story. We're going to get to your questions as well, and this is meant to be quite interactive. I'm just going to bring up another topic. This report is so rich in detail, we're not going to get to every point. But I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about the intersectional experiences that are mentioned in the report. And this is just another plug to read it, because this report breaks out experiences of Asian women, Black women, women with disabilities, lesbian, bisexual women, Latinas, there's just, again, so many different spaces in the report where you're going to find um, places where you identify yourself in the report and you'll have tools to even use at your disposal as you're reading it. That's That was my takeaway. But do you have any just basic thoughts on your takeaways as you looked at all the intersectional aspects of the report? Yeah, I, I think one of the most powerful pieces and frankly the hardest to see every time in the data is how much intersectionality plays into experiences, which really just means how different each of our experiences are in the workplace. And the reality is today, the further you move from a white straight male in any direction of those demographics, as well as I would imagine other ones that are harder to measure, but exist like, you know, socioeconomics, immigrant status, um, disability, which sometimes isn't visible. Um, the more you move into experiences where people describe what we call microaggressions, which you can think of as basically small, largely unintended um, headwinds that you get day in and day out in the workplace. These might be simple things like being interrupted and talked over. They might be being questioned for your intelligence, your experience, your background. They might be mistaken for someone who's not there to play the role that you're there to play in the room. Um, sometimes they involve more overt, challenging things like overhearing comments that are derogatory um, about your one of your identifying characteristics, um, not being included in events and activities. But in general, most people describe these as, I know that's not what they meant. I know that wasn't intended. I know he's not interrupting me again and again and again because he's like, today I will interrupt you. You know, it's just happening. Um, but it happens so much more frequently. Um, it happens more frequently to women than to men. It happens more frequently to women of color um, than to white women. If you were a black woman, you describe this experience again and again and again. If you're a woman with disability, you describe this experience again and again and again. And it's so noticeable and it's it's heartbreaking because it's hard what the data shows is how hard it is to appreciate if you don't have that experience all the time, how frequently that experience is to happening to people around you, right? And this is a lot of what I think companies need to acknowledge, like we, we don't have it right yet. And in fact, black women were most likely to say the last two years of the pandemic, their workplace inclusion went up because suddenly we were all on Zoom. 
Suddenly, it wasn't about my appearance or the backdrop. I could just blur that all out. Suddenly, I didn't have to think about if I was going to get a seat at the table or the invitation to the gathering or the opportunity because we were all democratized and equalized in our experience. I wasn't missing out on the inside joke or the activity because it was a lot harder for all those things to happen in a fully virtual world. And it says something about how much we're not quite getting right yet in the workplace that that's, um, that's the experience. And so that's been a lot of the, uh, the truth in the report. I think one of the biggest things we found was the experience of being an only. So when you are diverse in any form, you're more likely to say, I frequently find myself in situations in the workplace where I'm the only representing my gender, my race, my background. And the reason that's important is because that's associated with microaggressions. It's also associated with the pressure of, oh, wow, she spoke up you know, for that woman. It's probably because she's a woman. Oh, wow, she didn't speak up for that woman. Queen Bee, it's because she's a woman. Oh, wow, she said something. She didn't say something. She said something, but she didn't. You know, I mean, you're like, oh, my God, people. <laughs> the 17th man in the room, we did not scrutinize the way you're scrutinizing everything coming out of my mouth. And if you are a black woman, the frequency with which you experience being an only is so high. And so you have this experience that is described not only by black women, but in particular as I am both hyper visible and totally invisible at the same time. I don't have any of the sponsorship. I don't have any of the access, but wow, everything that comes out of my mouth, we're like, you know, like, mm, you know, categorizing it. And so I think for a lot of companies, you know, one of the things that's happened over the past two years um, with the murder of George Floyd, with the different conversation we started to have about racial justice was a recognition that, you know, the rising tide is not lifting all boats. In fact, when you look at that pipeline, the gains we are making for women are almost exclusively for white women. We are not making the same gains for women of color. And we have to have the honest conversation about we need to do different things to solve different problems. I find it really encouraging that year on year, this report grows more and more robust because more companies are participating. You're pulling more people. You're getting a lot of data from employees, managers, people all across the company. So I think, you know, there's so much work to be done. We know that. There's things to be proud of and hopeful for. I'm going to ask one last question of Alexis, and then I'm going to pass it over to the audience. Um, you want to sip of water? Even I feel like I I've been keeping you busy. Um, you know, one thing that you are able to do with this report is that you are able to look at the what you deem the top performing companies and really figure, like you're able to look at them and say, okay, here are the top two to three things that they all seem to be doing that is leading to these better outcomes. Maybe you could talk about just a couple that come to mind. Yeah, so this is my favorite part is that when we committed to do this report, we said we won't take this on unless we're going to do it for at least five years. And the reason we said that was because we wanted to be able to look and track performance over time. And most companies, and what we see in our own data, most companies have really fragile gains when it comes to diversity, meaning like all you need at the top is one person to retire, someone else to get a great job, and suddenly, you know, your C-suite drops by half in terms of its diversity. And so it's not easy actually to measure and even evaluate what it means to be a top performer. But finally, over the course of all these years, we've been able to build this pattern in enough of a data set where we felt confident. And there is a set of things that top performers are doing. And top performers to us are outsized gains in diversity at every level of the pipeline, including gains for women of color, sustained year over year. So there, it's really a track record. And they do a bunch of things, but to highlight a couple, that always stand out to me. They really dig into the data. They don't run away from it. They open up and look under the hood. They get really specific. They look across different job categories. We didn't talk about tech roles, but tech roles look like 1980, not where we want to go in 2040. And they get into that and they acknowledge it and they start thinking about solving at that level. And they're a lot more transparent about that data. And then, surprise, surprise, they tie it to performance. Like what measures matters, what you get evaluated on, what ties to your compensation, that sure counts. And they tie it into their performance. It shows up in performance reviews. Leaders actually own the diversity goal. It's not just talked about, but it's turned into specifics. Um, in organizations that are really leaning forward, they have knockouts in your compensation tied to not achieving certain performance goals on diversity over time. But they really wire it in. And then they get into the root cause of what's driving the bias or the structural differences they see. 
and they take action. So they say it's not acceptable to publish criteria if over half our employees say we don't use it. It's not appropriate to have maternity and paternity leave policies and then notice that none of our men are taking it. Why are they not taking the free paid time to be at home with their family, maybe a screaming baby, but also because they know there's inherent penalties and difficulty to unplugging from your job for that much time and they lose ground. And so they go back and they say, so what I need to change about the program to actually make it work. So they get into the detail of the wiring and they really work it on a different level. And I think that stands out. Thank you, Alexis. Well, I'm hoping and guessing that you have so many questions and things that you'd like to ask. So I am gonna pass it to you all. There's some mics. So if you raise your hand, um, we can pass some to you. So we'll go to the back of the room here first. Hi, um, my name is Erica and I'm a she, her, Aya. Uh, I'm a venture capitalist investing in female founded companies. Uh, a few of them are addressing the future of work. Uh, so this is very central in terms of our investment thesis. I'm curious as to your research today and how it's addressing, and, and, and even with you know, our companies, how are you addressing now the hybrid work environment and how you know, the challenges and the opportunities that result from a Zoom environment and now we're returning to work and how are we going to change for the, for the better as a result of this pandemic? It's such a great question. <laughs> um, I, I'd say on that one, I feel like we're still mid-innings and knowing what it's going to look like on the, quote, other side. I know the name of this was like post-pandemic. I was like, sort of, and yet, you know, I took a test right before I walked in the room. Um, it's negative, negative, everybody. Um, uh, but it's a great question, right? Because we don't, we don't quite know. I, what we see and hear clearly in the data, and this is consistent with other research that's been done, is that everyone expects we will go forward to something different than what we had in the past. And I think that's goodness all around. Because the number one thing women stated before the pandemic they wanted was greater flexibility. Now, hybrid without schooling or elder care or all the other things we talked about in a triple shift and a double shift, like, that's not exactly what great flexibility looks like, but we have the potential now to do so much more. And it matters not just in terms of the hours of the day and the commute and how you can build that piece in. It also matters for job mobility because even at the most senior level, two thirds of men at the top, in the sitting in the top jobs, do not have a full-time working partner. Two thirds of women do. And so if you've got to be in person five days a week and that next great job is in Cleveland or it's in Lagos or it's, you know, anywhere else in the world, the chances you pick up and move your whole family when you have the complexity that many women executives have is just a lot lower. And so I think it matters on multiple levels. What we see in the data is that men and women both want more flex and they want more hybrid, meaning they want more days where they can choose whether or not to come in. Um, women want more of it, though, than men. And one of the big worries that I have personally, and I know a lot of executives I talk to share, is that what if we go back and men start running into the office like, oh, my gosh, it's so quiet in here. And women don't because we already know they have the double shift. We know how much more they want that flexibility or at least some amount of that hybrid experience. And you end up with this mismatch, but we haven't solved how we value that and we start rewarding the people who are walking the halls, and we start mentoring and sponsoring the people who are walking the halls, and we start, and we don't notice we're doing it. And it has, it's not just for women, there's ageism there, there's like lots of factors for which that could happen. I think it's a huge risk. Uh, I think for most companies, what helps is when they're starting to set rhythms and try and say, look, you can come in as much as you want, but we're gonna have two power days a week where we try and do a bunch of stuff together or one week on and one week off, or I've heard like every variant under the sun, but trying to create some sort of structure around it. So the moments that really matter are where being together has a premium are really defined together. Uh, I think that's definitely going to be one of the pieces. And adding to that really quick, how you would measure performance when the, in evaluations yeah. in that, in that context. Well, right? that was the funniest thing. So many clients were like, Oh, it's so hard now because I can't see them at their desk. And I was like, did you really think just because you saw them at their desk, that was like a proxy for like, great job. <laughs> you made it, you know. 
<laughs> I mean, like that is the worst way to measure outputs uh, is by just staring at the input of you came in today. <laughs> I know you're sitting there. Um, and so for a lot of companies that actually what it sort of exposed was that the processes they had in place already were not that strong. But do you want me to hand you my mic? No, <laughs> thank oh, you. So we have someone in the back. <laughs> Um, so firstly, thank you so much for hosting this and speaking. This has been incredibly inspiring and I probably speak on behalf of everyone here. This has been a great talk. Um, and I apologize in advance if this question might be uncomfortable as a mother, um, as someone who doesn't have children. But for me, something that I'm experiencing during the pandemic especially is a family life stage bias. And I'd love to hear, my question is very specific on how to address or how to speak to sea level or below on the expectation on me as a single woman versus my colleagues who have children who block out half their, half their time in calendar for childcare. And I understand that. Um, but when it comes to performance reviews, bonuses, expectations, promotions, we're not being measured fairly. And... I feel it's causing a divide between women that is unnecessary and I don't want that. So how do I have a better conversation with senior leader, leaders about this topic, especially men? That is such an important question because this moment has, I mean, I, I believe we weren't measuring it this way, but I believe it existed certainly before, but this moment with all the disruption created an environment where there were such extreme experiences happening for people who lost a lot of the infrastructure that enabled them to be in the workplace. Then companies try to respond to that or create the empathy or the space for these, these things. They want to show up like they're showing up well. And then suddenly what happens is you have these huge differences in expectations. And what a lot of women in particular describe who don't have children who are seen to not have other obligations as serious or important as needy in this moment is, you know, well, you can take this on because you don't have, well, you can do this, right? And you create exactly this, um, this imbalance. I, I don't know that I have um, a great answer for you here. There may be others in the, um, in the audience here who do, um, in part because it hasn't been my personal experience, but I think in part because this is pretty new that we're actually having this conversation in this way. Um, I think some of it is, I, I believe a lot in getting to the root cause of what leads organizations then to operate this way or just kind of presume that you've got endless capacity and they can take advantage of that. And I think, so for example, in a lot of organizations, we don't do a very good job of figuring out what we're actually measuring and rewarding in people's performance and what leads to the next opportunity. And so we talk like, well, like, yes, you should take that on. You should take that on. That person couldn't take that piece on. And then they go ahead and they do this evaluation process or this, you know, this promotion process. And it doesn't seem like it's tethered to the fact base underneath it. Um, I think with a lot of leaders, they don't, they haven't spent a lot of time going back and scrutinizing their own process to question, is it working very well? I mean, what I find just in general is they don't. And I think in situations where you feel like you're disproportionately holding loads that are not being asked of other people, trying to make that more transparent, not about what other people are doing, but about the performance and the work that you are disproportionately contributing to the organization is really important because a lot of people aren't scrutinizing it very carefully. And they'd lump a bunch of stuff in a box of like, you know, good, you know, way to rally to the moment. And when in fact, it's like a whole second gig you're running or a whole next level up that you're performing to. And so I do think there's something about having that conversation. Um, in a country where we don't yet have the type of child care support we should, or elder care support or infrastructure support, I think the challenge is most companies actually should step up and do a lot more um, to step in where government has failed us in that regard relative to others. And if they did, what we would find is we wouldn't have these huge differences that then lead you to end up with the unmanaged outcome of the parent who doesn't have the support behind it. But that that's not the individual, you know, that's not the individual solve, certainly. I don't know if others have thoughts or if you do. Yeah. Um, I see a person back here who's been very patient in the back, so I'm going to ask that we pass the mic to her. 
Well, one thing I wanted to say is there's an, actually a term for the bias around people who come back to the office and who don't. It's called proximity bias. And so that's something we've been talking about. I'm a head of HR in an organization, and we've been talking a lot about that because we have some old school leaders that are all about, let's get everybody back now. Okay, let's get back in the office. And a lot of our employees don't want to get back in the office. Now, some have to. We have labs and, you know, scientific people have to be in the labs. But um, those folks that have been on site the whole time, some of them are the superstars and seen, and, and they should be in some respects, but in other respects, it's like, well, what about all of those folks that are not visible, that are not, again, being seen just because they showed up at work and being valued for that. So anyway, so proximity bias is a real thing and something we're working through. The other thing I was going to say uh, related to um, folks that have family caregiving responsibilities and those who don't. That's something we've talked a lot about during the pandemic. And we ended up giving a stipend for childcare during the pandemic so people could have in-home care if they felt safe doing so, or you know, to try to augment that for people with caregiving. And the research that I read, and I can't cite it here, but um, was that by providing that, it not only benefits those folks that now can work because they have caregiving, but it also benefits those who don't have caregiving responsibilities because they're not getting saddled with everyone's work that they would have been saddled with by those folks that had caregiving responsibilities. So we ended up doing it as a way of trying to balance the field, but it is, is something that again, we, we think about and talk about it on a regular basis of making sure how do we support all employees to the best of our ability. So anyway. Thank you. That's it. I didn't have a question. I just no. had comments. <laughs> I, I, like, I think proximity bias. Um, I see someone right here. Okay. I can't see who has the mic. You have to hold your hand up. Okay. How about, yes, it is a little hard to see. How about you go ahead on. and we'll go to you next. I'm live reporting live here. This this is a bit of a selfish question. It might be um, just related to some challenges I'm currently facing. I'm an architect. I'm helping a lot of people return to the office currently, reevaluating their workplace scenarios. Triple shift. Yes. <laughs> Triple shift for real, right? <sighs> anyway, um, I'm curious, like from a policy perspective, what are the like most in this is for the entire room here because we have HR people here, we have finance, we have a whole host of folks that are very smart and I'd love I'd love to pick your brains on this. But from a policy perspective, how what are the most influential things that space can provide for you? You know, and and in return. We hear things about um presenteeism, absenteeism, and I, I'm sorry, gal in the back, you just said something else. Proximity. I mean, like, I haven't even heard that one yet, but I'm I'm going to ripple some people's worlds when I start throwing that around in, in, in the design world. Proxietism. Like, like, come on. Anyway, I'm just curious, like, how, how can, as a cog in the wheel of the built environment and workplace strategy, how can I support um, diversity, equity, and inclusion? That's such a cool question. Um... <laughs> So I'm hoping some other people have ideas too. Uh, so what, what I think about that, I think what's kind of nuts is we got really excited about these open spaces and we're all going to like mingle and hang out together and bean bags or whatever. And then like the pandemic hit and you're like, I do not want to go near that thing. And how sanitizes that? <laughs> also, there are no walls and there are no private spaces. And um, so I think it's a really great question about how it needs to be thought through differently. I, I think we're going to move to a mode where there's more purpose to how people come together. And that's a really important piece about the space. Meaning like the number of times I used to go to the office and I'd be like, oh my God, I got to get on a call. And you run up the elevator and you run into your like desk. You'd sit down, you'd race to the bathroom in between. You get up at some point, you'd see one of them be like, oh my God, I'm so dead. anyway, we got to go. And then you'd leave and then you'd leave for the day and you'd be like, wow, that's really great. I'm so glad I was with everybody in that meeting. You know, and you can't see anybody. Like you didn't do anything. Or you all tromp into a room where you sit where one person talks for the whole, and then you tromp out of the room and you're like, God, that could have been, 
you know, over video or not at all and in an email. Um, and I think, <laughs> I think there's a lot to actually now putting purpose behind it. Like what we see clearly is that employees are saying, look, I'll come, but it better be worth it. And so what does worth it mean? Like it has to have some meat, like we're gonna do it because we're all gonna get together and let's do together in person what can only be done together in person to some degree. And so I think that does mean more collaboration. It's tricky in the context of people's sense of safety. Um, I do think the pandemic has flattened organizations. So executives say to me, I got so much closer to the people deeper in the organization because they could all show up in a Zoom. I could get with anybody. I didn't have to get on a plane. I didn't have to go do a town hall. I didn't. I could access. So I think there's something about finding ways for more people to contribute. And I think there's something really important about two-way because if any of you were on some like really intensive chat bomb threads in the course of something, which is just a sign that probably could have been done over email, but you know, people want an ability to actually engage multifaceted while the main stage aspect is happening. So those are my couple of ongoing thoughts, but I don't know if other folks have some. You should raise your hand so people can find you after. Yeah. Yeah. Find her, find her after. Shall we go to? I don't have a comment about that, but thinking about you know diversity, equity, and inclusion, and something that you have not mentioned, but I think all of us have felt at some point is the whole idea of imposter imposter syndrome. And what about with that imposter syndrome is external? Because when you are a black woman, when you are Latina, when you are Asian woman. Sometimes people think that if you get to a leadership position is because, oh, they needed to give it to her because, you know, we need a token. So how do you manage that? Does everyone know what imposter syndrome is? It's probably a room full of people are like, yeah, <laughs> I think so. Uh, right. Uh, and it, and it, I think you're really spot on to highlight it's not it's not only internal, it's external. I like that frame because there are aspects of it that are entirely about, and it's often psychologically described about this sense that you haven't earned or you may not belong or you shouldn't be in the seat you're in. When in fact, everything in the data we look at says that, wow, how much harder it was for you to get to that seat um, than for a man going after the same thing. And the data just, the data doesn't lie that it's literally, you know, mathematically that is true. And yet it still feels the reverse. And to your point about um, then the external frame on that is like, well, sure, but she got that because, you know, we needed a woman at the table. Um, it's it's so tricky. I I personally believe this is one of the reasons we need more data everywhere and we need more transparency because when you look at the numbers and you say, She's in that seat, and yet, for every 100 men we move forward, we're only moving 86. And yet, we go from 18% women to a C-suite with 2% women, 3% women, which means the vast, vast majority of C-suites in this country don't have any woman of color sitting in them. And yet, and you show all these different data points, I think it helps validate that this isn't, there's no way this could be something that's entirely about you individually and do you deserve to be here or not? Because statistically we're just getting it wrong again and again. And so um, you have to believe that not only should you be there, but there are three or four other people who should be there sitting right next to you who are not. Um, I, I truly believe that the data is one piece of it. Um, that's very important, but I think it's I think it's really difficult. And one of the things I, I truly dislike is in a lot of conversations, especially when I'm talking to leadership teams that are not diverse, they'll say, well, what do you say to the person, not me, of course, but the person who says, this seems a little unfair that we're just going to now help all the women get ahead and the poor men, not me, of course, I wouldn't say this, but what do you say to that person who might say, and I'm like, ah, yes, of course, somebody, that mythical somebody else. What I would say to you, I'm sorry, him, them, uh, not you, uh, is that the data doesn't lie, that you look at this math and you say, do you truly believe you do an excellent job choosing talent at the front end of your pipeline, that you get to 50-50, and that by the time you get to senior leadership, you are missing over half of those women, and 
three quarters of your women of color and that's because they just couldn't cut it? Do you truly believe that that's true time and again? And they're like, no, I don't, I don't believe it. Of course it's not true, right? Um, and I think that has to be part of what we do is we hold up the mirror and say, come on, like I'm gonna call the bullshit on that one. But it's really hard to do. Um, and it's used as an excuse then to say, I care about this, but I'm not gonna put, I'm not gonna put a goal behind my diversity because I don't want that goal to be like a quota. And then a quota would be like a tokenism and then a token. And I'm like, you're already worried about that and you don't even have anyone at the table. I mean, come on, let's start with getting some people to the table. Like any one of the huge number of diverse talents you're bringing into this organization. And then we can debate if you feel like you're doing that in the right way without, you know, quote this, this lowering the bar, which is the excuse that's often given. I think it's an excellent point. I want to be respectful of Alexis's time. And so I'm going to just ask for two more questions and I'm going to ask for them to be kind of brief. Okay. That's three. I'll take three. That means I need to be brief. I'll take three, but that means you have to be extra brief to fit everyone in. So I'll, we'll go with you first. Hi, um, my name's Sarah Nichols. I'm a plaintiff side attorney that represents women seeking equal pay. So thank you for the work that you do. And so my job is to, as you, I think, so eloquently put it, call the bullshit when, when it happens, when the... Um, and so one of the things that I'm having trouble with, and I think you so rightly pointed out, is impost some of the language over the last 10 years has not been so helpful. I think it's been a kind of a nice way to help people see their unconscious bias, like they've had too much at the bar, or the imposter syndrome, like it's something medically wrong with us. The one that really gets me is microaggressions, because I think it sounds like it's, you know, same-day surgery or something like that, <laughs> instead of, um, and micro. Um, at, like at an at atomic level. And I'd really like to ask a favor if you could partner with me in helping, because for me to prove discrimination, I have to show that it is intentional. And if people are calling it unconscious or a microaggression, it's really hard for me to get to say, this was discrimination. It's easy when I have an equal pay case because I could say Jim was paid X and Sally was paid Y, just the numbers. But this discrimination is still harder for me to prove if they can say it's unconscious or it's um, a syndrome or it's, a, it's something micro. Mm. So I just really like to say thank you so much. I love a woman who, or anyone who can spew statistics like you did on stage today. It's fantastic for me to hear that. But I'd also like to just ask you to help change some of the language on that. That's such a great point. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ellen. I'm Latina, born here in San Francisco, startups um, and high tech. Um, I'd like to try and end on a high note. Given the trajectory of timeline, how can we, you, as a leader and an influencer, raise up the next generation, the younger generation, if maybe perhaps some of the upper... Um, echelon is a little bit of a lost generation. So how can you start infusing all these learnings into grammar school, high school, et cetera? Uh, I think about this every day because <laughs> I have three daughters. Um, one of the things I felt was both a great gift and a real disservice was that when I was raised, I was told you can do anything. It's all going to be the same. You have a brother, two of you, same shot, same chance, you go. And I love that I was backed to the exact same degree by my parents and given the same shot of confidence, but I was sort of raised with this idea that I was in a post-gendered world and it was all gonna be the same. And it was like, well, not quite. And, and equipping, getting comfortable with the fact that we have a lot of uncomfortable things and unfair and unbalanced things still going on um, in the workplace is really important because how could you be prepared to call it out when you see it? How could you be prepared to respond to it, to actually um, navigate for yourself and also for those you wanna help out coming behind you if you don't actually even realize until pretty late what's going on around you? And so, I, you know, I love, um, well, my kids will tell you, I love talking about this topic um, quite a bit, but you know, I have conversations with them that I'm like, you know, you are gonna need to remember that when you go out, people are going to look at you and they may say, well, why? That's ridiculous. And I'm like, I know. And yet it's the case. So how are you going to actually respond to that? And the, the thing I like quite a bit about the rise in the conversation around allyship is this idea that it doesn't just sit with people who've had that shared experience or who know what it's like to be in that seat. We can all do something to empower and create that better opportunity. And I love how you're thinking about it all the way into 
early education. But what's interesting about allyship is it's a bit like this point you were raising on bias, like, oh, it just happens. It's not my fault. It's the bias. You know, allyship, we see this huge rise in allyship. In fact, three quarters of people now say they feel like they're allies in the workplace and they want to be allies in the workplace. But then when you ask them really specific things, wow, that is great. Are you a mentor or sponsor to a woman of color? Nope. Are you standing up against racial injustice? Like half of people will say, oh, I do. Do you create opportunities for others around you? To, like the tangible actions that would matter. I mean, those numbers drop precipitously. And so we do need to move from this point of like flinging the language around and patting ourselves on the back to actually acting on it. And I think that can start very early in teaching that skill. Like how do you raise the awareness that we haven't solved it yet? We haven't cracked it yet. And then how do you give someone like at least one practical tip or tool to do? In one tool, I'll just chime in. I have a son and a daughter. And so one thing I talk about with my son is I ask him to notice when a girl, because he has a sister he cares about, when is that per, when is that girl or your sister being talked over? And how do you amplify the voice of someone who is not being heard? So I think, you know, there's so many ways and we do that in the workplace, right? I've heard you say that about your female colleagues. And I've actually heard a group of women in the White House used to do this um, in this last administration, where they amplify each other's voices so that they can make sure that proper credit is also being given for ideas and for their work. I think we have one last question. Um, yeah. Just the person with the mic back. Thank you. I think, oh, there we go. Uh, I didn't imagine going last, to be honest. Um, and I have to say that the way that I met Alexis is because we were in a fundraiser, a room of 300 people, of which we were sat next to uh, one another at a table because we were the only two career moms in the room. Um, That's a true story. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, so, but I guess my question is that as a female CEO and business owner, uh, I think I'm in a unique position to actually have some power in making change. Um, and you know, I am very data driven. I love numbers. Yet um, I feel like, unfortunately, because of um, the world of money uh, and these large tech companies in this area, especially having the resources to pay for companies like McKinsey to come in and do, you know, studies and, and provide information. Like that's where so much of the focus is, right? It's like you have 50,000 people. We're going to go in. We're going to try to make an impact there. But we all know that that's like trying to move the Titanic. Um, so how do you feel like for smaller businesses or medium-sized businesses, like what they can do or what resources they can tap into when they want to make a change to get that sort of information? Yeah, it's a um, good question, Georgia. <laughs> um, I think... I think the great thing now is we actually have so much more information out there than we did a decade ago that people can um, can tap into and use. I think it's worth thinking about where you believe you have a path, a particular path to impact, like something you can do better than others because of the business you run, the money you funnel um, as a venture capitalist, like the access you have around you. And I think a lot of smaller organizations, one of the things you can do is you can myth bust some of the gatekeeping that goes on with the expectation of the role you must have had before in order to qualify for the role you have now. Because to this point about you know pay equity and discrimination and everything else, the reason it is so pervasive is all you need is the one job where you get passed over the broken rung to be three years behind for the next opportunity, to not have on your resume the thing that unlocks the next opportunity, so that by the time you are sitting there and as part of a diverse panel for the chance to be the CTO of XYZ, your resume doesn't look the same, even though intrinsically the skills you bring to the table are as good, if not better. Because all of the gatekeeping and those moments before where you were passed over when you should have gotten the opportunity doesn't set you up you know, for that, for that chance. Because a lot of what I think happens for women, and we see it in the data, is it isn't just that you get all the way to the top and you're the only one there. It's that you get stuck somewhere in the middle. You lose earning power. If you're in a dual career, you suddenly find yourself, if you also don't have pay equity, earning less. And so then when somebody, like in a pandemic, needs to step back, you step back. And I think what a lot of small, smaller companies have the opportunity to do, frankly, is they, they may have the flexibility to question in some of these cases, like, do I, do I have these structural things? Well, I need to see X years of this and Y years of that. And what, like, why do we need, why does it all have to be by years? Because for women, 
that's just going to limit so much of that opportunity when we still have today a situation where we're not seeing the pace of advancement we should and that female talent deserves. So. I think that we could go on and on because there's so much to talk no about with this report. <laughs> and I think, um, Alexis, you're such an amazing and engaging person to talk about this topic. So I'm going to just have to be the bad I'm not going to say bad guy. I'm going to be the person who ends our evening. <laughs> I was like, oh, you know, one of my pet peeves is I'll be in a room full of women and girls and they'll say, hey, you guys, hey, you guys. I'm like, there's no guys here. Just pointing that out. Um, but, you know, um, this to me, this room is proof that women show up. Women are motivated to get things done. And this report is so informative. I really, again, encourage everyone to read it deeply because you will find tools on how to be an ally. That's one thing we didn't talk about in as much depth as I would have liked. There's a disconnect between people thinking that they're allies and then people who are experiencing the need for an ally saying, you say you are, but you're actually not behaving this way. So Alexis touched on that. There are real tools, tips. If you are a leader of a company, if you are an individual trying to seek ways to avoid that broken rung, you know, there's no one system that's gonna work every single time, but this is very concrete. This will give you tools, steps, ideas, and I just feel very encouraged looking at this group of companies that continuously build over the years who are part of this. I think it's such a great sign that this work is so important, and if you can't measure it, you can't change it. So I just say thank you to McKinsey and Company, thank you to Alexis, thank you to Lean In. There's one slide that I wish that we could show, which is the list of contributors to this report. So I am going to ask you, just acknowledge all these people who have put this together because it is a really remarkable piece of work. And we will look forward to next year's report and maybe <laughs> having Alexis back or someone well, from Lean In sure. or a whole panel next time. But um, thank you for your engagement and thank you, Alexis, again for your time. So much fun. Thank you.